everyone welcome back to the no clip podcast this is episode 81 i'm your host jesse danny is on a plane or waiting for a plane he's doing something plane related right now that's all i know but uh we've lost one we've gained another back last week we didn't have him this week we do frank howley welcome back to the pod i'm back i made it i was i was on my way to the podcast recording in silent hill my my car crashed i was looking i <laughs> couldn't find it but i'm here uh, I think everything's okay. The walls are covered in blood, but I'm okay. Right. That's just That's a regular normal. It's a regular Wednesday for Frank Howley, <laughs> bloody walls. Uh, we actually, we didn't have you on the pod last week. You want to give your 140 character tweet review of Silent Hill real quick? Yeah, I watched it, I don't know, a decade ago. I liked it. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a good start to a review. Yeah, yeah. I, watched, I liked it when I watched it. I did, hated the sequel because I thought the sequel was a huge drop down. Or maybe it was because I was 10 years older when I watched the sequel. <laughs> but yeah, I think like when it comes to video game movies, the Silent Hill film like plays it kind of straight of like it adapts the core it doesn't try to like change or dumb it down too much it leans into the aesthetic of silent hill and then um i really like roger avery i think like everything he makes is kind of cool unique so um it didn't like necessarily have his like 90s pop flair but like it was it was solid and serviceable and uh yeah pyramid head and all that stuff is cool so yeah silent hill movie nice not bad oh that was like two or three tweets but i liked it that was good <laughs> yeah. uh jeremy still with us happy to have you here how's it going i'm good i'm still alive uh yes despite all the odds uh yeah no i'm chilling uh, i've just been uh we finished the bloodborne psx doc uh yeah. i just finished the second episode of my uh developing development series i'm not calling it developing that's mark browns from nope, game makers toolkit no nope. that was it, it is about developing games but it is not called that <laughs> uh no affiliation um but yeah i'm good i uh I, I ran out of my normal coffee, so I'm drinking weird coffee. So if I'm in a weird mood today, it's because I'm fucked up off of a weird, weird, weird coffee, coffee bean. What did you do? I don't know. I just had it in the back of my pantry, and it, I, I haven't <laughs> drank it because it's different and scary. My brain cut off pantry. I thought you just said pants. Like you just had some pants beans lying yeah. around. Right I keep a little pocket. A little bit, just in the back yeah, pocket, just, just in hold case. Hold on to them. <laughs> and uh, we're also joined by a special guest this week. You may know him from uh, the Big Dogs D and D live streams, <laughs> uh, Harmon Quest, and his own podcast. That happens. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey there, folks. Uh, hey, all you listeners. It's me, Spencer Crittenden. I'm a guy. Uh, you shouldn't know who I am. I think it's not weird to know who I am, but it's very normal <laughs> to not. Um, I just, you know, I'm on the internet, just like you guys, posting up a storm. You know. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm good to be here. Uh, since the last time I was on the show, I was born, <laughs> I graduated <laughs> community college, uh, but been doing good since then. Um, yeah. Thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah. We're yeah. happy to have you here, man. Thank you for making the time. This is awesome. Um, mm, nice. I, I, I'm a big fan of Spencer's work and, uh, I'm sure that there's crossover in our, in our listenership of people who appreciate Spencer's work. So we're very glad to have you. And also Spencer is a uh, master dungeon master. I don't think you can say master on both <laughs> yeah. ends of that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I'm excited to talk to you about not only video games, but also like about, uh, designing kind of like tabletop game experiences and how, uh, how you go about that and stuff. So awesome. Yeah, I don't know. You know, it's it's interesting. Being a DM is a little bit like designing a game experience, you know, so it, it's fun to like deconstruct real games from that kind of lens, you know? Yeah, yeah, totally. So, yeah. Do you take a lot of inspiration from uh, game like video games you play when you design tabletop stuff or is it very separate in your mind? I think, yeah, the, my three biggest inspirations are like video games and then like anime and manga and then um like Magic the Gathering, which is just this really wide, varying fantasy setting. So those kind of are like the main sources. But video games are huge just because like, you know, uh, you make a dungeon, right? And there's dungeons and video games. And you could be like, wait a minute, this Zelda puzzle seems like it could be really good. And so like I love pulling elements from that. I was just playing Wild Arms and um, there's very basic PlayStation one level puzzles. And I was like, all of this stuff would just be absolutely amazing, <laughs> like in a dungeon design. So, yeah, I love stuff like that. And I am really interested in game design, too. I don't know. I, it's it's I don't know. I, I wish I could someday do stuff like that, but I probably need more training. 
Hey, I mean, you've got a lot of the skills now, and I mean, we're uh, we're excited to talk to you about a little bit more of that. PS1 RPGs, everything. We're going to cover it. Don't worry. Uh, but uh, before we get into things, this podcast is supported by our patrons over at patreon.com slash noclip. You can sign up to get early access to everything we work on, exclusive updates, uh, behind-the-scenes content, and so much more. You can join uh, our illustrious Battle Pass tier as well and enter the ranks in the pantheon of patronage, which includes Cody Krieger, Aaron L. White, Forrest Pruitt, Cameron Ladd, George Sirkotis, Jacob Godserve, and Tohir Tiliev. Thanks, uh, thanks for helping us do all the cool stuff that we do here at Noclip. Speaking of, we put out a new documentary this week. Jeremy mentioned it there a little earlier. But Jeremy, uh, you've been kind of teasing it for the last couple of weeks. You've been inundated with your work on uh, on the Bloodborne PSX documentary here. You've been talking about PS1 games and working your way through some of the library. And you've also uh, been talking a lot about the aesthetics and everything. So it's kind of been the theme of the podcast for the last couple of weeks. So it's nice to finally have that out there. It was great to watch. I really enjoyed it. Congratulations to you and Frank. Uh, Danny as well. He's not here, but congratulations to him. I'm sure he'll be happy to hear that. Uh, and thank you, of course, to, to Lilith for all of her great insight and uh, and everything on not just her own project, Blood, uh, Bloodborne PSX, but also the original Bloodborne and like the PS1 aesthetic in general and how you achieve that look and everything. That was great. Uh, really cool stuff. And, and described in a way that, yeah, people who don't know what the hell game design is or how technical stuff works can really, really walk away from this feeling like they kind of understand the very basic level of it, which is super cool to see. Also a great outfit right that yeah, hat yeah I, I echo L- everyone in the comments i want that hat lil has dripped the fuck out also <laughs> uh yeah she's she's a fantastic communicator yes. of game design like um that's kind of the ideal no clip documentary in my mind is something that appeals to people who have an understanding of how games are made but also is like accessible uh to people who have no idea or like are total layman um and i feel like she explained it in a way that like like my mom watched it and she was like oh she seems nice and this is interesting <laughs> uh my mom doesn't talk like that she's not old uh if mom mom if you're listening i'm sorry, very sorry mom. for sorry for doing that stereotypical old lady voice i didn't beat it um <laughs> Uh, but yeah, no, I'm I'm glad to have the doc out. It was really cool, and uh, and like you said, I've been playing a bunch of PS1 games recently. Uh, so it was cool to just like I just needed a shot of Silent Hill for to illustrate a point she was making, and I just like fired up Silent Hill again and played a little bit of it. Um, so yeah, it felt felt right in uh, right in my comfort zone. But um, uh, yeah, I'm I'm glad to see that people are enjoying it, and uh, and Lilith is really cool. I want more more PS1 D makes, um, which is it's a it's a tall order because you can't monetize them, obviously. So uh, it's like a hard, hard niche to sustain yourself on. But I'm glad that uh, that people are doing it all the same. Yeah, you can't run an economy on D-Makes, unfortunately. Maybe one day we'll all be able to riff on each other's work. Uh, but this was your first documentary back uh, doing like a in-person interviews, right? In almost a, over a year now. What was it like working on that compared to Discord stuff? Yeah, it um it definitely makes a difference. Mm-hmm. Um, there, There's just there's just like a... I mean, you know, like anyone who's done a Zoom call knows that it's like not the same level of human interaction as seeing someone face to face. And I think that is uh, doubly true when you're meeting someone for the first time and also asking them like pretty, pretty in-depth questions about something that they are very passionate about. Um, I think it's like it's a little different than catching up with your friends on a Zoom call uh, where there's already kind of like an in-person um, rapport or whatever. But uh, yeah, it was cool. I mean, we took a lot of precautions to make sure it was done safely and stuff. And uh yeah, it, it felt good. I'm, I'm. It, it's nice to know that we can do stuff like that without having to, uh, like, put anyone at risk or make anyone co- uncomfortable and stuff. So, um, yeah, it's cool. I, I'm, I'm glad we got to do that one. I was very excited about it. Nice, good. Yeah, important to to stay safe and try your best to do that, especially in these trying times. Uh, Frank Howley, you did a great capture on this. It was fun watching it. Uh, you've done a couple of these comparison documentaries over the last couple of months, uh, where you're you're playing a game and then playing a game that's the exact same game but looks slightly different. Um. I can imagine that gets a little tedious. I can't even think about doing that on my own. But have you gotten uh, any any sort of tips and tricks on making that more fun for yourself? It's weird. I feel like I kind of like it. I mean, it, really? I guess this also syncs up with like Nathan Fielder's The Rehearsal. But it's fun like going through Bloodborne PSX and I'm learning the zones. Then when I played it on PS4, I'm like, wait a minute. Okay, I know I know this. Like, it's the familiarity. So it's it, it just feels like one big game. Um, yeah, the other two examples was Demon Souls PS4. I mean, or sorry, PS5. That was like that felt like it took like a whole month. But then when I needed to do the PS3 stuff, I did like a month's journey in like one week on one week on PS3. I was able to like one shot or like one uh, one life bosses and stuff like that because I had done, done the grind on PS5. Right. And then um, 
Half-Life Black Mesa, I guess it also feels like a D-make, played through all of Black Mesa. <laughs> and then when I played Half-Life 1, I was like, oh my God, this is, the graphics are so lo-fi, this is sick. Um, and then and then um, Jeremy will market, Janny, is almost called Janny, uh, uh, Jeremy <laughs> and Danny. That's, that's when me and Danny like go <laughs> oh, high yeah, yeah, Fusion. Yeah. Yeah, it's fusion. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll mark like important sequences, like with Half Life Black Mesa. We definitely knew we wanted the uh, the the uh, the experiment going wrong and, and buzzing and everything like that. So it's like there's certain shots we'll try to remember to get the exact same angle, the exact same like uh, yeah, the exact same shot shot compo- composition. Um, and so I'll even mark that in the in the in the um, in the footage too. But yeah, it kind of makes it easier. Like sometimes it can be stressful. Like there's one big project we're working on where I'm going through like 30 games and every time it's like, Oh my God, can I get this to the settings? Right. All this, da, 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 da. but when it's like, when it's uh, in the same exact like wheelhouse, it's so much easier just to like flick through the, through the two. Or when we do series where it's like sequels, it's like, okay, this is familiar as opposed to completely relearning something to illustrate a point. But uh, yeah, the game itself was cool. It's free to download, free to play. It's like a five hour game. Like it's actually pretty meaty, especially it's a souls game. So it's kind of tough. And I had played it like a few months ago before I even knew we'd be doing a doc on it just for fun. So, yeah. And then Bloodborne, I've gone through so many times with both these games. It's like I've played, spent so much time playing these. Like I even popped up a bonus Bloodborne run like in, in like January just for fun. So it was like, oh, I, I was like already uh, ready to play it. Nice. Yeah. I need to check it out myself. Uh, it's on H.io if you want to grab it. Bloodborne PSX. You can search that there. Search it on Google H.io. You can find it. Uh, I haven't played Bloodborne myself, so I have no experience with that game, but it sounds like this is the kind of thing you could play anyways and still have a really good time with. Uh, obviously, Lilith adds some stuff to the end of the game, different content and everything. She talks about it in the doc. You should go watch it if you haven't already. YouTube.com slash noclip video. Spencer, uh, have you played this uh, demake at all? you have any experience with Bloodborne itself? No. My first uh, Dark, Dark Souls or you know Souls-like game or whatever was just Elden Ring. Um, I don't know. You know, there's this, this thing... Everyone's like, oh, it's so hard. It's so hard, you know, and it's like, I don't know that it just was kind of off putting to me. And then I played Elden Ring and it's like, well, this is, you know, as hard as like Mega Man or something. But like <laughs> I play games that I guess a lot of people say are too hard. So I, I was kind of like pre- expecting it to just be frustrating. But it's like, no, I like you see what you have to do better, you know. And so now I want to go back and play all of them, especially Bloodborne and Sekiro. But I, I haven't touched them yet. Yeah, I wonder what that experience will be like, because Elden Ring isn't too, too different from the kind of core design of the earlier Dark Souls games, but it is different enough that I wonder if you're like, you know, people play Bloodborne, from my understanding anyways, uh, play that and go back and play the earlier Dark Souls, and they're a little bit more of a hardcore kind of like, I'm not, no shields for me, I'm dodging around kind of player, Um, but this is like open world to kind of a more structured design, so yeah, that'll, that'll be interesting, I wonder what you'll feel there. I do just remember now that I'm talking that I did actually play Dark Souls 3 before Elden Ring. I guess I just completely forgot. It was really hard until I found like the punch weapons, the Cestus. And then I was like, I'm just going to punch everybody. And then it was really awesome. <laughs> it You know, I'm sure it's way harder just because you don't have reach and stuff. But I was just you just feel so awesome when you beat anything by punching it. You know, so <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, I wonder if you can punch people in Bloodborne. I'm not sure. Yet. Can you, you guys? I can't remember. I, if there's a punch weapon in Bloodborne, um, I I also feel like going back to like uh like Dark Souls one because you're somebody who plays a lot of retro games. Um, I feel like it won't be like it it is kind of just like a retro Elden Ring. Like there's obviously kind of like quality of life differences, and you can't jump, which feels very weird after playing Elden Ring and Sekiro. Um, yeah. But uh, Dark Souls one is fucking awesome, dude. Mm-hmm. I think you'd really like it. Yeah, that's the thing in Dark Souls 3, you can't jump either. And that I was really chafing against that. And then when Elden Ring came out, I'm like, thank goodness I can I can jump. It, it, it does great. feel like weirdly limiting. Like it makes you feel like you're a thousand pounds because all you can do is just like fat roll around. <laughs> But we, we mentioned it a little earlier there, uh, you know, Jeremy, you've been kind of walking us through this adventure of PS1 games, their aesthetic uh, design, you've been playing a lot of RPGs, we've been talking a lot about that lo-fi aesthetic and how it impacts design and how it makes things look really cool, uh, and it's nice to finally have the thing out where we talked about those ideas with a developer who's been working on a game like that, um, and, and the reason that we have Spencer on here, actually, is we've been working on a sort of special secret project in the background that we'll hopefully uh, be able to do soon, but Frank mentioned It'd be really cool to have uh, Spencer on here because he's been playing, uh, like he said, Wild Arms and you're, I would imagine, a RPG fan. And Jeremy, you've been working your way through classic PS1 RPGs. So uh, I kind of wanted to get us all together and talk about 
some of the classics because I don't have and I'll, I'll admit this right off the bat. I don't have a huge experience with the JRPG genre of games. Uh, you know, I was born 95, didn't really have any game consoles until 2008, 2009. So I didn't, really, uh, didn't get to play a lot of the older sort of classic uh, RPGs. They were out mostly uh, three years before I was born, a lot of them, which is a little gross. Um, but I do, you know, Kingdom Hearts, Final Fantasy VII Remake, 15 for some reason. Um Pokemon, all that kind of stuff. But Frank, uh, you know, you suggested this, but I don't think you've ever really talked about playing JRPGs on here all that often. Do you have a a big experience with them or what? It's so funny. When I was like a kid, like in the PlayStation era, I had friends obsessed with Final Fantasy and stuff, but I felt like JRPGs were way too hard for me. Like I just didn't have the the patience to grind or I didn't even understand the system because like, yeah, they were they were brutal, and I'm trying to think the first. So I feel like Western J- West, West, Western, Western JRPGs. JRPGs. Yeah. So like West by Japan. the like I played like on Xbox. I played Knights of the Old Republic and Jade Empire. I think it's because you could quick save all the time in those, so it was a lot easier. Um, it really wasn't until like my early 20s that I sit down and was trying to like fill the gaps in all of my gaming. So the like like the there was like a week or a month I played Final Fantasy VI. And Chrono Trigger. And like I'd played Final Fantasy 7 before, earlier, like a, a few years before, but I played Final Fantasy 6 and, and Chrono Trigger in the same month. And those are like two of the best games yeah. of all time. Like the the third JRPG I'd pick is like my favorite of that SNES area is Earthbound, which I didn't play till a few years later. But as I was older, then I began to appreciate like it was weird because at this point I was like emulating the games. I think Final Fantasy 7 I downloaded on my PS3 and played through it. We're like I kind of at the point I kind of liked how retro it was with like the the graphics, especially Final Fantasy VII, the polygons, uh, the music of and, and all these games are it's the best soundtracks. I like, still listen to them, even like the chip tune of it still sounds beautiful. The stories are always really compelling, and uh, yeah, when you when you crack open a JRPG, it feels like you're sitting down for a giant like manga epic or an anime epic, and it's kind of different than other games. I feel like with so many other games like. Well, I, I think JRPGs, the, the thing that it's also synonymous with like, is like 80 hours, even though like I feel like <laughs> Final Fantasy VI is like was like 20 out, 20, 30 hours. Like some of the Super Nintendo ones aren't that long, but like in my head, mm-hmm. they're huge journeys. But I think at the time in my life when I was like post college, I kind of, yeah, maybe I didn't, wasn't really propelled in a full career yet. So I kind of needed something to pass the time, but also like listen to podcasts with or audiobooks. So I would like play JRPGs, enjoy the grind, and listen to like audiobooks and podcasts and then uh look up ig and walkthroughs for complicated uh, dungeons but like it felt good filling those gaps in my gaming knowledge and i really fell in love with like the beauty and charm of those games because i think they're all so charming because they're so sincere yeah now i feel like every year i'll go through like one or two jrpgs like like you know even like the personas and stuff like that but yeah i was kind of a latecomer um but i'm wondering if like jeremy or, or spencer did you guys grow up playing jrpgs was this a late love like what are your guys histories with them so I didn't play them on the Super Nintendo. I, I okay. So my my history is I had an NES. Uh, Mega Man was one of the only games I had. I had a Genesis. Sonic was one of the only games I had. And then finally we got a PlayStation. And basically the first games we got for PlayStation were Wild Arms, Saga Frontier, and Final Fantasy VII. Probably not in that order. I don't know. But those were all RPGs. And I don't know. It wasn't my well. Saga Frontier was my decision because I saw a robot on the box and I was like, oh man, look at this <laughs> robot. And uh, But the others weren't, I, I don't know if it was my brother or my parents, but it had the effect of these games are so long, you know, you can you can spend so much time on them that it's like a real value for your, for your buck. But I could never get too deep in them because I was just never grinding. I would be running from fights, I would be progressing the story, and then you just hit this wall where it's like, unless you like stop to grind, you're just not going to win any fights, you know? And mm-hmm. also... A lot of those RPGs, they can be a bit confusing. Like we had game facts back in those days and stuff. But like when you got stuck, sometimes you're just like, I don't know. And then you just move on to doing something else, you know, but I, I really like them a lot. I don't know. Something about turn based battles is just really fun. I guess, you know, Pokemon is really cool for that reason. But I, I just like them. I like the story. I like the characters. I like they have this very specific kind of like I want to say even like PlayStation one era humor, which is just like, <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of like that was written into my bones or something. And so it still really tickles me in a way. But yeah, I don't know. I, I just like I like side quests. I like exploring, you know, and, and Saga Frontier has a lot of exploration. But I, I, I like that about um, RPGs. And in a lot of games, 
especially newer games, it feels like even the secret areas and stuff are like they want you to find this. They need you to find this. It's not like really exploration where it's like, oh, my God, what did I stumble into? You know, it's like, here's the area or a lot of times there's not really too much uh like backtracking reward, like in a city or something, there won't be a lot of changes of dialogue. But, you know, in in our in the old RPGs, a lot of times there would just be so much new stuff you can find. And it just always felt like so much deeper than it truly was. You know, it felt like such this living world, even though it was very basically accomplished. You know, I'm sure it took a lot of effort, but it's like, yeah, let's just do uh, five more dialogue options for this, depending on when you come back in the game and stuff. But it just, especially as a kid and stuff, it just really felt like you're just exploring this whole other universe. And and it was really enlightening. You know, I do D and D and so exploring made up worlds is like a huge part of that. And I think that, you know, it just really resonated with me. Nice. Yeah. Your point there about the, the dialogue options. I mean, one of the first RPGs that I think I ever played was, uh, or not first, one of the earliest I ever played was uh, Final Fantasy 1 and 2. And, you know, those games are all about communicating with the NPCs to figure out what's going on. And, yeah, certain events change things. And there's something really novel about that, uh, having communications with these NPCs and kind of seeing them evolve as time goes on and react to the world. It felt like you were impacting things in this way that wasn't just like your XP going up. It was really like the world was feeling what you did to it. So, was, I mean, you know, how many other games were pulling that off in the in the 90s and stuff? There's a reason that it's existed for however many years now, 30 something years, Final Fantasy. Crazy. Um, Jeremy, you have been playing Xenogears. Have you updated that at all? Are you still stuck on that? What's going on? I am still playing it. It is, it is extremely <laughs> it is a long. Video it's, game. Like, it's like 80 <laughs> hours long. Um, yeah, I'm like a little more than halfway through. Uh, and yeah, I'm really enjoying it. It's, I've I said this on the podcast before, but it's kind of like playing Final Fantasy VII for the first time as a kid, but again, in like in a different universe where it's a different story. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I like Final Fantasy VII was one of the big ones for me as a kid, but I played a bunch of games uh, like RPGs as a kid, uh, Earthbound also being one of the big ones. Um, I had a school assignment when I was in like first, second, third grade, something like that to do. It was a creative writing assignment where you like write a sentence and then illustrate it and do like 16 pages. And I just wrote the first like three hours of Earthbound (laughs) down (laughs) and drew them um, and just ripped off the story. Uh, So like, yeah, I don't know. I um. I as a kid playing RPGs, I think the thing that struck me the most was that it um uh, these like interactable story worlds uh like Spencer said where you can go back and talk to people. Mm-hmm. There's this feeling in uh more linear media where sometimes something will happen and I'll be like I wonder how like I wonder how like this guy feels about this and being able to go and talk to that character um it's also like there I I would like to see RPGs go deeper in that direction obviously like a lot of older uh, RPGs kind of you just go back and the the shopkeeper's like oh the weather's bad now and like it's one line or whatever <laughs> um but I I like that's why that's why Disco Elysium appeals to me so much is because there's there is so much depth and even though it's largely just a lot of kind of like branching nodes of different uh, permutations of the story and then getting to like navigate how you talk to people about that um, it feels complex enough especially in contrast to how uh, how kind of like shallow the social aspect of other RPGs can be sometimes that um. That's like that's what I'm interested in. Like I've never I've never had a group to play uh, tabletop RPGs with, and that's kind of what I've always wanted video games to fill the niche for me as is like allowing me to go into a story world and kind of like act within these these like these logical rules of the universe and this kind of like world building that's been communicated to me and be able to just like push and prod that world and talk to people and kind of like, you know, go get this thing and bring it to this person and be like, Hey, what do you think about this? And then have that actually ripple out into the the game responding like the, the ground like rising to meet your feet, no matter what you do, dire- what direction you walk in. Um, so yeah, I don't know. And the, the thing that appeals to me about like, going back to play these PS1 RPGs is um it's I've been thinking a lot about this. I don't know how much of it is nostalgia because obviously I haven't played these specific games, but uh but that era holds a lot of nostalgia for me. So um yeah, I don't know. I think I think part of it is that it was just like a golden age of of RPG design and I think another part of it is just that uh for whatever reason my brain calibrates differently when I'm sitting down to play these games than it does contemporary games. Um, I don't know if it's like I put less pressure on them or I put less pressure on myself to like have a certain type of experience or something. But to me, it kind of feels like going and watching like a classic movie where I'm like, 
I don't, I'm not like sitting down to watch like a film noir from the 1950s and going like, why aren't the special effects better? Like, I don't know. <laughs> I could see the strings. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. It's just, they're just like, they're, it's a very particular type of experience they give me that is hard for other games to emulate. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, and I think modern RPGs can learn a lot from them too, which is uh, like, I'm, I'm working on a, an RPG adjacent game. So uh, I'm trying to, trying to bring it back, boys, single-handedly bring back the golden nice. age. Thank you. Somebody's doing it. Someone has to do it. Someone has. It might as well be Jeremy Jane. Why not? An editor for a for a video game documentary channel. <laughs> Why not? But to your point about the like that kind of why do PS1 games feel kind of like their own thing? I wonder how much of that, especially with the RPGs, I wonder how much of that has to do with the fact that like SNES and and that previous generation of games, they were really nailing the storytelling. Like some of the story stuff in Final Fantasy VI is like tight. It's just dope as hell. So then you get to the PS1 and you're like, oh, now you can do video cutscenes. Now you can do big orchestral soundtracks, you know? So you take these already well-established, like, good things and you go, here's a whole new dimension of rendering this entire world. They can be bigger. They can be more bombastic. Like, do you think that plays into it at all or, or is it something else? I definitely think that's part of it. Yeah, I, oh, I, I don't know. I'm just trying to think if, like, the types of stories that they told were differently there were different as well i like one thing i've noticed in a lot of the late 90s uh squaresoft rpgs especially is that uh, a lot of them are about like like eco terrorism but the eco terrorists are the good guys or like politics but the people who are like more uh anarchist leaning are the protagonists and um yeah i don't know i wonder if like i wonder if that's part of the reason disco elysium appealed to me as well is because it had uh kind of like a political, like a radical political core to it. Uh, because that that feels to me like a, that's a really good world building to me. Things like um, like I'm trying to contrast it with a with more like a like a popular contemporary game. And I was thinking like The Last of Us has a mature story, which is obviously part of the reason it's very popular. But I also feel like it's told in a way that's very uh, individualistic. It's It's largely about what's happening to individuals within this world and less about like the sort of larger uh larger trends and events in the world and like how things are handled that is like mentioned but it's kind of a kind of a a background thing um rather than the story uh so yeah i don't know there's something about those games where it's just like it's like i've mentioned this a million times but the the joke is that jrpgs are about like killing god um and like especially old ones and i think that uh or dethrone attack and dethroning god i think that's the meme um but yeah i like those like those grandiose stories where you're like a kid from a rural village who has amnesia and you have to like go murder the universe. It's fucking awesome. <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of sidetracky stuff that you end up doing when you're playing uh, role playing games like D&D, you know, uh, or anything in that sort of realm is, is you're, you're always kind of you're given a basic task of like, hey, let's go save this princess from a tower and then it's like well actually dm how about i go over here and murder this king from a different kingdom and then i'm gonna just burn the whole kingdom down you just keep going on these crazy adventures um i just you know i can't think of a lot of games that capture that kind of feeling of like being able to do whatever you want that dnd pulls off so well i mean frank and, and spencer you guys have been doing this big dogs it's more of a very comedic uh kind of D uh run through but i mean is that is that something that you uh, like about playing D anD D? Is that something that you go to it for? Is it a mix of that and the combat? What What are your feelings on playing D anD D compared to video game RPGs? Um, so yeah, I think like when I'm trying to get people to play D anD D who've never played it before, I say like, oh, well, think about like the most open world RPG you've ever played. You could do so many things. You have so many dialogue options. You know, Disco Elysium actually probably gets some of the closest ever because just the things you can do are nonsensical, and the world just reacts to it. It doesn't like treat it as like a no, that's the wrong answer. Please select the right answer, you know, like <laughs> right, sort of yeah. thing, which is what a lot of games do with like, uh, you know, kind of fake choice. Um, but I always say like, OK, you could do a lot of things in a video game, but can you pee on the king and then, you know, <laughs> poop into your hand and then throw it at the court jester? Like you can literally do that in D&D. You could just any you could do anything. And then the DM's like, no, you can't do that. Like that doesn't happen. The DM just has to roll with it and go like, I mean. Yeah, if that's what you want to do, if you want to just decide to like grow, you know, drugs and sell them out of your your <laughs> your covered wagon instead of going to the dungeon that the guy hired you, I can't stop you. You know, if Frank wants to uh, serve 
<laughs> serve um, a bunch of uh, Taco Bell items to an Etter cap, you know, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Maybe that helps. And it did. You know, it's it's really cool. I, I don't know. What do you think, Frank? It's uh, it's so weird because like for me, I, I unlocked the fun of D&D and it really is just like being a kid on the playground and making stuff up. Like it's so fun. But again, we're couched with with Spencer's a dungeon master. And there is something fun about coming up with like the, the silliest, dumbest like improv bit. And then Spencer's like, all right, you got to roll for it. And then you roll and it like like it's still grounded in this gameplay system and it's like it's so weird uh and i feel like yeah spencer is such a fantastic dungeon master one thing too that sticks out is like we get you mentioned like infinite dialogue trees is like with dungeons and dragons each person picks their own character and it is like making a new character in a jrpg and like it's what every time i start a video game a jrpg tony hawk create a skater it's whatever i'm into at the time and so when we started D D like Four months ago, I was go, just going through Todd McFarlane's Spawn for the first time. So my D and D character is Wario Spawn. But then Spencer <laughs> built me a character sheet, and we actually figured out like, oh, Spawn's kind of like a warlock. He has a cape, he has witch bolts and stuff like that. So you pick your stats, and it really is like making a character. It's like, oh, do I want to focus on speed, strength, agility, whatever? Uh, and and uh, and then Spencer is amazing because as a DM, he'll play like twenty characters in a single like. D and D session and has to be ready to go and uh, it's always surprising. Yeah, I guess like for me, the way I play a lot of video games, if I'm not like, if I'm not doing it for no clip, if I'm if it's like if I'm play, streaming it or playing at home or playing with friends, I always try to break games. I want to see like, can I do this? Like in Tony Hawk, can I corner glitch underneath the airport? Can I break this system? Can I glitch this? And with D and D, I feel like I try to make dumb suggestions. And Spencer's like, okay, we're doing this now. Uh, and and it's like that is so fun to, to be able to do that. Like. I feel like the closest thing that gets that is like VR chat, even though it's not a video game, the the way we access it, open it up on Steam, control, keyboard and mouse or headset feels like a video game. But VR chat is the same thing where it's like imagination and just whatever. If someone designs it, you can do it. Um, but yeah, it's it's imagination at its core, I feel like. The, I think the the VR thing is actually like is an interesting parallel because um, I played uh, uh, Phasmophobia with some friends of mine and the three of them were just playing on uh, like mouse and keyboard and I had my VR set up for it um, and you can like play with people even if only one person has VR. And it was really funny because it allowed me to do kind of like like dumb physical like comedy bits to make my friends laugh that are totally orthogonal to the game and so we're like going through it. and it's, it's like that's the thing that appeals to me about uh about like rpgs that allow you to push in weird directions and like like you walk up to the king and do like an impression of him in his face and then have to roll for how good the impression is um so in phasmophobia we'd be like going through a scary high school with flashlights and shit and crucifixes and then like i'd go hide around a corner and just start like dancing and waving my arms so that when my friends came in it would just like shatter the immersion of this moment and i think that like yeah that's why vr is good for, it, it, like a similar kind of thing because it uh it allows you to do weird things that are orthogonal to the game and i also think that that's um that's part of the appeal of half-life alex in some capacity as well even though it's not a social experience uh just the like the vr allows for so much uh physical interaction with things that it allows you to express yourself in this world in a way that is kind of off rails um it's just that it's just that generating like a social experience that creates the same type of uh, like orthogonal nature to the story is is more difficult because it's usually just an uh, like writing a fuck ton of options. And also, I've been thinking a lot about this while working on on game dev projects. Is that um the the way to kind of like if you, if you give a player a bunch of options in a list and say like oh you like shit in your hand and throw it at the king there's something that's that's like fun like that's what disco elysium does to give you those weird options but there is like i've been curious about ways that games could curate that experience of coming up with it yourself um but the problem is is that like your options are maybe you have like a text input field but then then do you just write like 6000 nodes for every conversation for every option and it's and it's also like there's something very i asked a bunch of my friends how they'd feel about an RPG that had an open text input like that. And most of them were like, I don't want to play like Monkey Island. Like it feels old or something. <laughs> um, but old games had like, I feel like uh, a lot of old games had ambition, which is why they did stuff like that. Like I'm curious if there is more uh, more work to be done in, in that kind of like open-ended RPG design. Yeah, I think you can see it in a lot of indie games right now. I, I just, uh, you mentioned a couple months ago, Wildermyth. And I checked that out couple weeks ago with my buddy Adam uh, and it was a good time like it, it definitely is one of those games where there are scenarios that are set up ahead of time and you're kind of filling in the slots and they're happening at random moments but even that sort of thing feels like such a rare 
moment uh, in, in game design where you'll get that overlap of like, here's what players will want to do and here's what players will be excited to find out. It's almost like the surprise of the thing is the joy of it. Like just the fact that that could happen is almost more enjoyable than like just knowing that you could make it up. But then on the other end, yeah, like I wonder if there is a way because there are those kind of I think Divinity Original Sin 2 has it that sort of DM mode that they have in the game where you can set it up and you can place your items and everything and, and write stories to go along with stuff. But then at that point, aren't you just like making a video game, you know? <laughs> yeah, without doing all the legwork of making like the art and the engine yeah. and stuff, it totally basically is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's like I, I, one thing, one solution I've thought of is um, having objects, having a ton of objects in the world that have a bunch of different like interactable states to them, like kind of like puzzle box items, and then being able to present them to characters, I think is one way of doing it because then it's... um it's not a list of dialogue options that's growing as you uh, get more information. It's just the entire world has like, whatever, 90 interactable objects and you can present each one of them to each character. But then again, that's like, that's also kind of like old point and click adventures basically did that, you know, like, a, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that was the height of <laughs> video games was monkey Island. It's, we're backsliding <laughs> now. <laughs> well, we're coming back soon. We'll be returning to monkey Island shortly, right? True, we, dude. We can feel like we're there again. Uh, anything JRPG related that we want to talk about before, uh, moving on? Yeah, I guess I, I did. Spencer is in the middle of breath of breath of fire three. I've never touched those games. Those are Capcom's JRPGs, right? What, what, what are those like? Yeah. How do they stand out from like Final Fantasy or anything else? Are you digging it? I've only played this one. Um, it's like, I'm again, going back to all these games I had when I was a kid, but never finished, but breath of fire three has been pretty great. One of the cool things about, again, this one, I don't know if there are the others, is that your main character can like turn into a dragon and you pick up dragon genes in different places and they're like items, but you can combine up to three dragon genes when you're doing a dragon transformation. And so then you can become all sorts of different kinds of dragons. Like, so there's the basic fire gene and then there's the reverse gene. And if you go fire reverse, then you're an ice dragon. And so like, it's just, it's again, it's, it's interesting with like discovery and it can be so simple. It's just like, let's combine buying up to three of these in-game objects and you get a whole new move set whole different stat blocks and stuff but it doesn't tell you you have to learn that from exploration and so it feels really cool when you figured this or that out you know and also i just like you can switch characters wild arms is the same way where you can switch characters and they have different abilities that affect the map in different ways so you know your party composition kind of changes up how you might move through a level or what secrets you can unlock it also has this master system where you can you can learn under under a mentor and um, that changes the stats you get from leveling up. So just like all of these kind of systems, these interesting deep mechanical systems can completely change how the the game plays from one person's playthrough to another. And that's that's another thing I just really liked about JRPGs. And it's just I don't know. It's just really unique. I think something about the scope of those games and um you know, they weren't too big. They didn't have too many art assets. It let them just like focus on like deep mechanical systems that interact in really interesting ways and let that kind of carry you along with the story and and make like the Ludo narrative kind of thing feel really nice. Yeah, that's awesome. I want to play that game. Uh, that's on my it's list. Breath of Fire 3 and 4 is supposed to be very good. I've been playing uh, Suikoden 2 and you can like it's one of those games where you can fucking mass effect your save file from one and oh, it, shit, I, I guess it impacts two uh, but I haven't played the first one so I've been playing the second one and uh, like I, I looked up just like a couple of the early game references to the first one because I was like I wanted to know how much I was missing uh, and it's mostly just like some of the world variables are changed and then like uh, in the first 10 minutes of Suikoden 2 um, you like wash up on a river and like a bunch of bandits come and like take you back to their camp as a prisoner I guess the main bandit is like one of the characters from one or something uh, sorry spoilers for the first 10 minutes of a game that came out 20 <laughs> how years dare ago you? Uh, I'm really sorry about that guys um, <laughs> but uh, yeah no it's I, I I feel like there was an understanding in a lot of those games that um that people might be jumping in at a at a random point in the series especially because Final Fantasy that's kind of the convention right is that it's um like some of them are in the in the same world there's like the Ivalice games or or whatever that uh I think like Vagrant Story and a couple of the Final Fantasy games take place in. But yeah, I think they're I think they were just like people will probably just jump in at any point when they you know, no, just because you have a PS1 and Breath of Fire 3 doesn't mean you have like a Super Nintendo and whatever. So um yeah, it's it's cool that they all stand alone at least. Yeah. I gotta play more JRPGs, man. I feel like this that's totally there's my There's not shit. enough time. There's not. there's not enough time. Like Frank's Dude, been saying why... they're 80 hours. I fucking hate it. I just want to play one for like 10 <laughs> hours and get it over with. 
on the record, I've never, I don't even know what an emulator is. I've never heard of that. <laughs> but but off the record, uh, having a turbo button in save states is very, oh, yeah. very helpful mm-hmm. because, God damn it, sometimes it's just like, Sometimes we're just like I got I got like a job, man. I can't be like adventuring for a hundred hours. Where's the save that's how, points? Yeah. That's how I did Final Fantasy VI. There's a point in the game, late game, where you can grind like these Tyrannosaurus Rexes or something, and they drop like eighty thousand XP or something like that. But like, so I think I remember an hour just like turbo save, save state, turbo, like just just doing it, and then I was like, okay, then I did the rest of the dungeon. I feel that's my favorite thing in every JRPG. In my and I remembering like. Uh, I feel like it was like Nino Cooney. There was an equivalent of like a metal slime. There was one place we can grind it. I would spend like four hours grinding it, and then the rest of the game is easy. And there's something fun about cheesing it like that. Like I don't know, it gets comfy and you feel badass. It's your mo- training montage where you just grind one thing. <laughs> it's um, like that episode of South Park where they're just fighting the the pigs or the hogs or whatever oh, yeah. in, in World of Warcraft. Yeah. <laughs> something cool about it. Yeah, I love grinding. I mean, I don't. I hate it. That's I think that's my problem with JRPGs. Is sometimes they ask you to like Final Fantasy two. You got to grind out all your abilities for however many oh, hours. Boy. That was the best feature. But, but one last thing I was gonna yeah. say. Speaking of grinding, Spencer talked about. Um, being a dungeon master, designing levels. And that reminds me of like, in Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, I never thought of it this way, but if you do the create a park system, you're kind of like a skateboard dungeon master. You're developing like the <laughs> skate park. And now it's like, holy shit, I got to go back. Because I think the Tony Hawk remaster has a create a park, but now it's like, I can be a DM in Tony Hawk. I never thought of it Tony that Hawk way. Tony Hawk RPG coming That's from like Frank the, Dude, That really it. needs to be the next evolution in a skateboarding game is like some cross where you design skateboarding dungeons, but you can make, you, you can design the level too. So that, I want an idea. I want an RPG where uh, where the combat system is a Tony Hawk inspired skateboarding oh. system. So you like run into a monster on the road and you have to like do the sickest trick to kill it. That, oh. I, 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 I'm half no, joking, yeah. but unironically, that, yeah. that sounds so fun. Jane Dev episode three. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have too many game ideas already. Can't dude. wait fuck. to see it. You're you're tied oh. to it now. You mentioned it. Oh my god. Okay, kick kickstart it, and I'll make it out of uh, <laughs> guilt and shame. I did have one question. Frank, you brought this up in our, our sort of secret little special chat that we have going on. Uh, you're playing Marvel Ultimate Alliance oh, yeah. 2, 1? No, so I'm going to the original X-Men Legends. X-Men Legends, sorry, yes. Those two are the same thing in my mind. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. How, how are you liking it? How's it going? It's it's so funny. So, like, I'm doing this Project Xbox thing where I'm just playing a bunch of old-ass yeah. games I never touched. And uh, I was, I've was i always been charmed with the idea of X-Men Legends because it's an X-Men, like, dungeon crawler almost like a diablo clone like i like game i like beat em ups i like games where you can grind i like getting xp it's got loot um and i started playing <laughs> x-men legends i'm like man this game is so good they should remaster it like i want to play it i just I, I wish they would remaster i want to play this game and then i kept coming back to it like this is so good i wish i could you know remaster it have it online i get i wish i can get achievements and then i'm just like like i'm like like chipping it down i'm like well wait a minute and they're not going to remaster this i might as well just play it and so i'm i'm like i really like like every week i'll open it up and i even have friends coming over now and like taking turns we've now had to invest in another xbox controller because i had a five dollar uh knockoff xbox controller called the gamester oh uh, yeah. which i had three i had two friends over so it was the three of us playing we started playing and then one of my friends is constantly dying and we're like what's going on and he's like yo my a button doesn't work <laughs> so, the gamester failed him he's got the little brother controller yeah, yeah the little so brother they, and then my friend my friend found out if you press the button really hard it does work but it's like no that's not good so we had to get another controller and i still need more xbox controllers because they're all they're all they're not in good condition, but it's really fun, and it's so funny. Through X Men Legends, I'm kind of like wanting to get back into X Men. It it was made in like I feel like o two o three o four or like posts of the success of the movies. Like Patrick Stewart is doing the voice of Professor X, but yeah, I, I like it. Like I think again, maybe the reason why I do like what like Western RPGs or action RPGs is like they're a little bit more simple. With X Men Legends, you pick a stage, you jump in, you beat up the bad guys, but it's kind of punishing. Like it's I feel like the Marvel Ultimate Alliance games as they went on got easier. X-Men Legends is hard. If you die, you have to spend credits to revive your teammates, but you don't have that many. Um, so you have to grind in the danger room, which is like the X-Men's training facility. The danger um, room. It's, uh, yeah, <laughs> but uh, it's really, really cool. And uh, yeah, so and I feel like, again, it ties to this conversation we had about like just playing games for the sake of it, the joy of it. And it's like, yeah, again, if it was remastered, oh, I'd have like this, 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 like overhead of like, Oh, I can get achievements or maybe there's online leaderboards or something, but it's just like the game in it is inherently so simple and so fun. And it's like, man, I legitimately can't wait to play more of it. 
oh, it's always really fun diving into a piece of media that like no one's talking about. Like I feel it's such a like private experience. I feel like it's made just for you. Like that's what it was like getting into Spawn thirty years after the fact. Like no one cares about this, but this is so goddamn cool. So yeah, X Men Legends is good. And I guess like I was joking about like we're gonna talk about JRPGs. We can talk about Western RPGs. But like yeah, the closest thing to an RPG is like it's like an action RPG. It's like Diablo, and even that is like a, an interesting like like a uh, spin-off of the RPG. I'm trying to think if there's even like Japanese like action RPGs like like not exactly, but even Link to the Past has hack and slash and that kind of has JRPG tropes. Um there's the um Tales of Abyss, like the Tales of series yeah, which is kind of a series, hack, and, yeah. hack and slash JRPG mm-hmm. where you go into the battle then you, you're mashing buttons. Dynasty Warriors is so different, but you're also leveling up. There's like features and like this is a widespread of games, but like there's features in all of these that I really, really adore. Um, but yeah, X Men Legends, completely unrelated, but I just wanted to say it rules. <laughs> no, that's a good point though about the JRPGs and how like they they have different vibes to them. Each of the games that we call JRPGs, it feels like such a broad genre label. I, I guess that's a good question. Well, what what do we think of when we think of JRPGs? Because to me, it's all vibes. Like you look at something, you're like, that's a JRPG. But is there is there anything you guys can point to that you could say like this is this is what makes a JRPG because you've you've been playing a bunch of them Jeremy I mean Spencer this has been kind of something you've been doing for a long time Frank you know we yeah we do what we will <laughs> the the like quick buttons that come to mind is eighty hours SquareSoft party system <laughs> yep <laughs> that's like like doesn't all have to qualify it and then I think of like. Yeah, and then, yeah, Spencer mentioned turn-based battles. Like, that's at its core, even though other games have broken that. But, like, those are, like, when I hear the JRPG, I think of that. But then, like, Persona 5 fits that, where it's, like, 80 hours, uh, turn-based party system. Characters, I feel like characters is so, so rich in JRPGs. Like, and then every character's backstory, which I get, like... Western games, like I feel like that's something that Bioware ex- like did exceptionally well. It's all in every Bioware RPG, they really nail every character as their own backstory. But I feel like Final Fantasy seven, six, like ten, yeah, every character you can get their ultimate weapon. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, I'm actually something I'm curious to ask Spencer about is I, I really like one of the things in JRPGs that I like that I'm curious if you do this in Dungeons and Dragons ever is um or like any tabletop thing you DM where uh. I like in in RP, old RPGs especially where like a character will be characterized through um through the way that they act in in a combat scenario. So like you'll have a combat scenario where you like engage with an enemy and then like a character who's not part of your party potentially uh will hop in and like do a thousand fucking damage and you're like, "Oh, this guy's awesome" because he just like fucking di- I've never seen anyone do that much damage. Um do you ever like are there ways in which you use combat systems as like a storytelling mechanism as well? Yeah, you just kind of got to be a little light about it because uh, there's this thing in D&D or you know RPGs more broadly that they call railroading, which is generally seen as a bad thing i think you know it's all whatever it's all relative but you don't want to be caught railroading which is to say like you don't want to just cheat and say okay you know you get knocked out you know like you got to kind of make it feel like it's it's part of a, a decision tree or something like it's not just being forced upon them but yeah i do stuff like that in combat um just recently we 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 i wanted everyone to go into an arena and they fell through a trap door but one of the characters didn't get fall fall through the trap door so like every Every enemy that was there just spent all of their effort trying to push them into the trap door. And it's like I had to roll and wait for it to happen. But it's like, yeah, the odds were stacked against him, but he kept like resisting it. So it's not like, no, you fail anyway. It's like, you know, these people have this power to do it and they got to do it. And so that's kind of the balance you want to strike. But I mean, combat is a cool way to, you know, show off characters. The thing is, NPCs are really important for um, like providing instruction because like concepts don't exist without an NPC to like deliver them or without the players facing it themselves. Like if you see the Empire's army, you get a sense that there's an Empire's army or you could just have someone walk up and say, have you heard of the Emperor's army? You know, it's our Empire's army. It's a big deal. So like NPCs are really important, but players sometimes don't like NPCs. So you got to make sure they're like likable and enjoyable because you can literally kill them or like ditch them in some way so trying to make npcs unique and endearing in some way or cool in combat is a really good way to have them stick which is again important for like delivering world building and stuff so i like having like special powers that are unique or seem really interesting and and are generally outside the the bounds of what you can make in your own player characters 
Um, like I had a character who was basically a stand user, like from Jojo, um, <laughs> because I thought like, oh, if there's a character who can like punch people invisibly from far away, they'll be like, what even is that? We, you know, this guy seems cool. And so then he can like hang around and, and try and guide action and stuff. That's so cool. Wow. Like, I love the idea of that stand thing. That's great. Can I, you got to write that down. You got to share that with other people. <laughs> well, I do a Patreon. I'm, I'm going to work on yeah. that as a monk option for uh, my Patreon. There it is. Call it out. Do the advertisement. Drop it. <laughs> there is one thing I want to touch on real quickly before we hop to uh, to the email for this week. But uh, you mentioned, you know, this is whole. We started this because of the Bloodborne PSX documentary, and that's a demake. And uh, again, in our, in our little private chat, uh, Spencer dropped a link to a demake of Elden Ring for the Game Boy. Can you tell us yeah, a little bit about that? What's Boy. that up? What's that about? Uh, there's a guy named Shin, um, and I, I don't know too much about his work, but I just heard that he dropped an Elden Ring demake, and uh, I, I got I had to check it out because you know it's it's so extreme, <laughs> you know, like the PlayStation <laughs> yeah. is probably at least somewhat approximating like the gameplay and stuff, but a Game Boy has two buttons, you know, so um, you're playing Dark Souls and it's top down. It looks very much like Zelda, um, and you have two attacks, like a sword attack, which is like a really slow, you know, Dark Souls sword animation and then a roll which is funny because your character just becomes a head that goes into four orientation like uh, you know upward head left head upside down head right head right <laughs> and and so you just dodge around and stuff so um you know it's pretty it's pretty basic you kind of go a couple screens and then you fight the big royal revenant or whatever it's called with all the with all the arms and then that usually kills you i suppose i never beat it but then you know you go a couple more screens and you talk to some guy and then like all of a sudden there's like the erd tree guardian and it's like oh no you know but it's it's very much like like zelda honestly um but you know you could you could feel all the influence in it and it goes into 2d segments that allow you to platform but uh, until you know those segments you can't really jump or anything um it, it's yeah I, I didn't get too far into it it was just you know i was like oh well a, a souls like d make that sounds relevant to what you guys were talking about <laughs> um but it, it's pretty fun but it's, it's very hard i mean which is like game boy games game boy games were so hard <laughs> like I, I i had a bunch of game boy games i couldn't beat almost all of them <laughs> basically um so it, yeah it was definitely a pretty interesting representation yeah, I had one of those cartridges when I was a kid uh, with like 89 games in one or whatever. You had to put a, a pin to hit this little button. It was like a total ripoff, like stolen version of all these games packed onto a tiny cartridge. Oh, and wait, what is this? Did you buy this at like a flea market? My my aunt and uncle, who uh, were not very tech savvy, I guess, probably found it at someone's garage sale for like two bucks. It had like TMNT and um, Super Mario Land or whatever the hell, like all those little games you remember. But it was all packed onto a single Game Boy cartridge. And they would all you just slap it in there and there was like a tiny little button. You had to use a pin or a pen uh, <laughs> to kind of poke this button to switch the game whenever you turned it on. That was a real nightmare. I stopped working because I think I stabbed the cartridge a little too hard. I'm sorry, Uncle Sonny, <laughs> for wasting your two dollar uh, gift you got me. Did it have did it wait? Did it have. OK, so presumably this is like a piece of kind of like, you know, uh, gray tech. or black market, yeah. you know, bootleg merchandise. Did it have like a cool name? Was it like Game Dude or anything? Ah, uh, yeah, that's a good question. I definitely didn't have the Game Boy cartridge shell and the title and everything. It was probably something like Game Bro. I think it was Game Bro, actually. <laughs> Game um, Bro. That's yeah. sick. That rocks. <laughs> <laughs> let me let me put in my game bro now it's like i got game an bro. r4 with my micro sd it's like nah man go back to the good old days i got my I got my game bro i'm plugging that into my game boy but spencer when you link that i was like there's a whole this is gb studios what they use to make this game there's a whole community of people making game boy d makes of stuff uh and i and i saw a list of them and i was like and we've been talking about this a bunch uh throughout this whole pod there's a disco elysium game boy d make Oh, really? Yeah. It's super short. It's oh like the God. first 20, 30 minutes maybe of, of the original Disco Elysium. Um, you wake up and like you go downstairs and you meet some people and you, there's a body for hanging from a tree. And then like it's it's super quick and you kind of just get the idea. It's almost a demo of a demake of uh, Disco Elysium. But it is really cool. The music was actually remixed to work on the Game Boy and like it has these really cool menus and it does the storytelling in a really like 
tight way um because obviously if it was a million lines of text like you see at the beginning of disco elysium it would get a little exhausting or even the stat check stuff is really cool like it has these little dice that animate on the screen and you stop it so you're not like just randomly getting dice it almost feels like you have some degree of control over the interaction so it reworks it to make it work on the game boy which i mean that was you know bloodborne psx that was kind of how do you make this game feel as though it would exist on the PS one, not just how do I turn this into a PS one game? How do I make it feel like it came out at that point in time? And I feel like they kind of nailed that here with this, this uh, disco Elysium game boy remake is very, very cool. Um, I guess you check that out. You'd like it. It's fun. It's the music's really nice too. It's like an eight bit, almost like lower than that. Uh, chip tune remix of, of some of the greatest songs from the beginning of, of disco Elysium. I like that stuff. Do you guys check out any more, by the way? Because we haven't, we talked about D-Makes a long time ago, probably a couple months ago now. Um, And it didn't sound like many of us have really played any. Has that changed at all? Or are you guys still not, uh, not touching those? We have too many regular games to play. I've not played that many, to be honest. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I, I need to check out more though. The Disco Elysium one is interesting to me because uh, when, around the time Citizen Sleeper came out, I was thinking a lot about the way in which um, games can like, be economical about the creation of their art assets by uh, by being representational. So like in Citizen Sleeper, it's just you're seeing the space station from above uh, and like you're not seeing all the people walking around and stuff. It's just character portraits and an overview of the space station. Um, and it's interesting because I bet the I bet the Disco Elysium Game Boy remake actually holds up pretty well because the writing in that game is kind of the centerpiece. Uh, and so like I, I, that's not to that's not to discredit the visual art because um, I think his name is Alexander Rostov is the painter who did all the oil painting for that game. But it's like it's one of the most striking games I've ever played in my life. But I also feel like if that was you know if that game looked like the James Bond game for Game Boy I it would probably still be really good also check out the James Bond game for Game Boy oh it's lit i love all those conversions on the Game Boy uh you, you mentioned the the paintings there the when you, you know at the beginning of the game of the original Disco Elysium when you first look in the mirror and there's that yeah. ugly shot of the oh, character. Oh, they do that? They do that, but it's like super bit crushed. So it's like all the black levels are a little weird. It's super cool. I love that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just, I, I like D-Makes now. Since we talked about them, I was thinking about it. Like when I was a kid, I was playing stuff on mini clip that was like, hey, yeah. this is, this is uh, Sonic the Hedgehog 3. And it's like, no, it's not. <laughs> um, I'm playing it on my like Pentium 2 computer with the worst internet on the planet. It took 13 minutes to load the game. Um yeah, I've always been playing these. I just didn't realize it's because when you're when you don't have any money and you can't play the main game, you're gonna play some cheap rip off, some guy person, you know, some person made on the internet. Why not? Uh, yeah, I like that stuff. Sorry, I just want to talk about Demix. I saw this Disco Elysium one. I was like, I, I know I have to bring this up. Hey, never apologize for your love of old <laughs> old shitty video games <laughs> and my Game Bro cartridge. <laughs> We do have one email here from Spencer. Uh, hello, everyone. I just wanted to clear I up. Did, a, wait, uh, hold on. Sorry. A, this, to be clear, this is not Spencer, our guest, who's on no, the podcast. No, Spencer, well, yeah, Spencer shot us yet. an email. I mean, sure. Spencer, did you write it? <laughs> if you just want to ask us a question, you can have. just do it. <laughs> yeah, <I mean. laughs> yeah, it does say, fuck you, Jeremy, at the end here. That's a little, no, I'm just kidding. Oh, my God. Um, Spencer, you know? I didn't know you were like that. How did you know I was an asshole so nice. before we met, dude? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, Spencer, last name. Uh, sent us an email. <laughs> now I need to. Now I need to get it. Now you've got me. Like I need to double check <laughs> Sorry, what the dude. email is. You've done this to me. No, no. It's. I'm sure. I'm sure you're right. I'm sure it's a, another Spencer. There's at least probably Spencer's two. Spencer's like a super rare name that, but also there's just never one Spencer. There's always like more than one Spencer, and it's like, how does this happen? I've never heard. <laughs> I've never met anyone named Gordon, but there's two Spencers. Like I don't know. It's strange. how does this? Work? I, the only two references to Spencer that I know are you, Spencer, and Spencer's Gifts, the uh, store at the mall <laughs> that sells like silly string. <laughs> yeah i worked with a spencer he was a, he was a real hockey dude bro maybe like the exact opposite of you spencer like he was just <laughs> such a jerk to all these people but he was a he was a nice guy oh, when no. you got to know him oh. anyways uh this is different spencer spencer greenfield asks or sends us an email rather uh correcting us on our silent hill uh movie trivia we were wrong on oh something. no yeah unfortunately they say, hello, everyone. Uh, I just wanted to clear up a misconception that has followed around the Silent Hill. Uh, while the movie is very clearly inspired and based upon Centralia, Pennsylvania, oh, yeah. the original yeah. games are not. Uh, it's a misconception that's hard to pin down, but the Japanese development team did not know about Centralia in 1999. Uh, Masahiro Ito, who worked on multiple Silent Hill games, has clarified that on his Twitter. Uh, and it's something that Jess O'Brien or Voidberger, who uh, is over at uh, giant bomb now right uh has talked about on her various silent hill related videos with bob's vids on youtube 
Uh, when it came to making a movie, it added another spooky layer to the whole thing, but it is one of the things that's not inspired at all by the games. Sorry to be pedantic about all this, but it's something that's been pervasive for years and it's not worth spreading. Keep up the good work. Sorry, Spencer. Sorry. We tried. We tried our best with the trivia on that podcast, but I mean, there's so many fun things to talk about, so many fun things to bring up when we were we were watching it and reviewing it and everything. So I, I saw that tweet by one of the Silent Hill devs after we recorded the podcast, mm-hmm. and I felt I felt bad. I felt like a pit in <laughs> my stomach where i was like oh no this is like this is how this is how lies happen and i am part of it one th- one fun fact about side hill this is probably well known but like uh the film kindergarten cop served as a visual reference <laughs> when they designed the elementary school in what? silent hill so there's <laughs> screenshot comparisons there's like general like kid art and school psas on the board in kindergarten cop and those textures are in silent hill and like even the design of the school like like if you just if you go if you search like kindergarten cop silent hill people have done the comparisons so they use that as like an american school to design uh their their elementary school school in Silent Hill. That's so. amazing. With Arnold? Yeah. What? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Is uh, is Dolph Lundgren in the second one in Silent Hill 2? Inspired <laughs> think, by Kindergarten think, Cop 2? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe they made a sequel to that movie. Why did they do that? Yeah, I don't know. If you want to send in an email, it's podcast at noclip.video. Let us know what you're thinking. Correct us on other things. I'm sure we've been wrong about stuff in the past. Feel free. Never. That could, that probably has never happened. That's the dude. one time. It's the <laughs> one time we've been wrong. We patch our podcast. We fix the bugs. <laughs> Yeah, we so, yeah, we're going to go back and yeah. retcon that to have never We're going to re-record the whole thing. We'll do a whole new review. It'll just be Frank. Just Frank giving his yeah. thoughts on Silent Hill. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Hope you enjoyed. Uh, thanks so much to Spencer for coming on the pod. We really appreciate it, man. Yeah. Thanks so much. I appreciate talking about video games, hanging out, you know? Yeah. Yeah, dude. You're you're literally an uh, open invite. You're always welcome to totally. come hang out. Yeah, please. Uh, this Hell was fun. yeah. Also, Spencer, uh, plug anything you've got to plug because you've got some cool projects that people should check out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I do. I have a show called Harmon Quest. You can check that out. Um, I've been told that it's available for free bl- various places, you know, in the corners of the Internet. So <laughs> if, if that interests you, I, I've heard that's out there. I don't know. Um, so, but yeah, check it out. I think it's a lot of fun. If you've ever been curious about what RPGs really are like, not like what they are in t- TV shows and, and cartoons, like how it actually comes down. Cause it actually is a lot more like how me and Frank play. Uh, but me and Frank, we do play on Frank's stream Tuesday nights, big dogs, D and D, um, that happens at around six, six 30. We're skipping the next couple of weeks. Um, but you know, and you know, maybe we'll, we'll finish forever, but They'll live on in our hearts and you'll be able to watch the archives of that really silly Taco Bell based Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> um, I do a Patreon. I like kind of silly D&D content. And so I do a Patreon where my content is a bit more not super silly, but it's just a bit more interesting. Like I have a, a bard subclass that's a stand up comedian bard and he can like roast people to death, you know, with his insults. And so, you know, fun stuff like that, but also more serious stuff I'm working on. Um, by the time this comes out, my, it'll probably be. Uh, my next month will be out where I have a dungeon based on John Carpenter's The Thing, where you go into oh, this what? frozen kind of facility, and there's like this monster lurking. I'm not exactly sure how it's going to play out because it's not like, oh no, is my other party infested and and they're an imposter? I, I like I, I like you could do that, but I didn't want to set that in the rules. But you know, so I do stuff like that. I also have a uh, the Sixler itch.io where I, I sell modules that are pretty fun. Um, but yeah, the Sixler itch.io and patreon.com slash the sixler for my DD content i also do food reviews i i, I eat <laughs> jack in the box uh seasonal items and tell you if they're a hit or miss you know it's i love food so I, i'm kind of all over the place you guys but but that's what i got going on and you know uh we all need money you know and uh <laughs> anyone listening to this you probably need money too but if you have money i need money too so <laughs> You know. Fund this renaissance man. Fund this renaissance man as he eats Jack in the Box and designs adventures. <laughs> we need more reviews and you need to fund them. Uh, speaking of funding things, <laughs> patreon.com slash no clip. If you want to support what we're doing, support the podcast, get stuff out there. Uh, we've got a lot of new stuff that's come out in the last couple weeks. Uh, July has been a kind of hot month. We had the Bloodborne PSX documentary, of course, we've been talking about. By the time this goes up, we might have another developer breakdown out. If not, It'll be next week. It's on Weird West. It's already been announced, so I'm not spoiling anything. Uh, we had that Doom doc, or the gameplay, sorry, come out. The development stuff for Doom 4 and, and Doom 2016. That was really great. Uh, and production team members, if you haven't already, get on Patreon, get your keys, 
it's time. All right. We're, we're showing off that cool new game we've been working on with, with Alex Austin. So you can get in on that and you can listen to the full silent Hill 2006 movie review podcast. It's on patreon.com slash no clip. And it only has one error. It only has it one only error. Has one yeah. Which we will be patching uh, before you go listen to it. So yeah. don't worry. It'll be, it'll be gone. Version 1.1. 1. 1. <laughs> it'll be fixed up. Uh, thanks so much for listening. If you want to keep up with what we're doing, no clip at no clip video on Twitter. Uh, you follow me at Garasha. Uh, Frank's at Frank Howley. Jeremy is at Jeremy B. Jane and Spencer. You're at the Sixler, correct? Yep. The Sixler on all the things. Nice. Good, good. Uh, before we head off, what's everyone doing this week? What are we saying? What's uh, what's the vibe? Spencer, what are you doing? Um, I, I, I just learned on TikTok you can make something called a Mississippi pot roast. And I made one, <laughs> but it didn't turn out well because I didn't have enough meat. So I'm going to go for a round two, see if I can't master that TikTok recipe. <laughs> <laughs> mm, more meat more meat for spencer nice nice that sounds, sounds good, delicious dude. you got to review it oh yeah well that's the thing i want to do more cooking content um, yeah so look look for that maybe i don't know <laughs> Hell yeah. can't wait to see it frank what, what's up with you what are you what are you saying this week uh audrey and i are going to anime matsuri in houston uh right. a giant ass texas anime convention which like i'm i'm interested to see what that's like so i'll be taking lots of pictures uh my friends have been telling me it's 100 degrees and humid in uh houston so but it will be air conditioned. Audrey landed today. She confirmed there's a sky bridge from our hotel. So we probably won't go outside unless there's a pool. But I'm also curious, Every pl- everywhere I travel, I always try to look at their local comic book stores. So maybe maybe I'll go comic book hunting. But uh, yeah, I'm ready for another anime expo. Nice. Grab some X-Men stuff while you're there. Get back oh, into yeah. it. Dive deep. Yes. Uh, Jeremy, what about you? What are you saying? Uh, I am putting the finishing touches on Jane Dev episode two today. Uh, check it out on our No Clip Crew channel, our, our our sister channel, side channel. I don't think it can be a sister channel if it's run by the same people. I don't think that counts. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that and then uh, yeah, I've been I've I finished two big documentaries in the last week and a half. So I'll probably like yeah, break time, sleep for maybe a forty bit. hours yeah. and then play a bunch of RPGs uh, and then sleep more. Deserved. Good man. Yeah. Take your breaks. We need you. We need you limber. We need you. T- <laughs> we need you ready. I'm not limber, dude. I'm stiff. That's what I'm, I'm saying. Stiff. You got to get out there. I'm we got to get in the yoga classes, man. Come on. True. Myself, I'm house sitting a girlfriend or my, not my girlfriend, my fiance. I, I got to get used to that one still. Um, yeah, you're going to get in trouble, dude. You yeah, can't I know. I'm anymore. sorry, Kathy. <laughs> She's going to email us with a correction again. It's a lot of correction. <laughs> That's here. the email next week. <laughs> your, your fiance. Uh, Jesse. No. Um, and yeah, I'm going to go see Nope this weekend. I'm still firing oh, through yeah. Triangle Strategy. I'm I'm living in the in the JRPG world too, but yeah, nope. Whew. Cannot wait. Nope is gonna be a yep for me. I can already tell. I'm gonna hate it next time we talk. <laughs> I guarantee it. I just I just jinxed myself. Anyways, thank you so much for listening, everybody. We appreciate your uh, your support and your your fandom. I don't know, listening to the podcast. Take it easy. Enjoy the rest of your week. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>